This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Plague Ship by Andre Norton. Chapter 2 Rivals. That's far enough, Izzy. Although traders, by law and tradition, carried no more potent personal weapons, except in times of great crisis, than hand sleep rods, the resultant shot from the latter was just as unpleasant for temporary periods as a more forceful beam, and the threat of it was enough to halt the three men who had come to the foot of the Queen's ramp, and could see the rod held rather negligently by Ali. Ollie's eyes were anything but negligent, however, and free traders had reputations to be respected by their rivals of the companies. The very nature of their roving lives taught them savage lessons, which they either learned or died. Dane, glancing down over the engineer apprentice's shoulder, saw that Van Ryck's assumption of confidence had indeed paid off. They had left the trade enclosure of the Salariki barely three-quarters of an hour ago. But below now stood the debadged captain of the I.S. ship and his cargo master. "'I want to speak to your captain,' snarled the icy officer. Ollie registered faint amusement, an expression which tended to rouse the worst in the spectator— as they knew of old when that same mocking appraisal had been turned on him as the rawest of the Queen's crew. "'But does he wish to speak to you?' countered Camille. "'Just stay where you are, Izzy, until we are sure about that fact.' That was his clue to act as messenger. Dane retreated into the ship and swung up the ladder to the command section. As he passed Captain Jellicoe's private cabin, he heard the muffled squall of the commander's unpleasant pet. Queeks, the hubat, a nightmare combination of crab, parrot, and toad, wearing a blue feather coating, and inclined to scream and spit at all comers. Since Queeks would not be howling in that fashion if its master was present, Kane kept on to the control cabin, where he blundered in upon an executive-level conference of Captain, Cargo-Master, and Astrogator. "'Well?' Jellicoe's blaster-scarred left cheek twitched as he snapped that impatient inquiry at the messenger. "'I see Captain Below, sir, with his Cargo-Master. They want to see you.' Jellicoe's mouth was a straight line, his eyes very hard. By instinct, Dane's hand went to the grip of the sleep-rod slung at his belt. When the old man put on his fighting face, look out. "'Here we go again,' he told himself, speculating as to just what type of action lay before them now. "'Oh, they do, do they?' Jellicoe began, and then throttled down the temper he could put under iron control when and if it were necessary. "'Well,' "'Tell them to stay where they are. Van, we'll go down.' For a moment the cargo-master hesitated. His heavy-lidded eyes looked sleepy. He seemed almost disinterested in the suggestion. And when he nodded it was with the air of someone about to perform some boring duty. "'All right, sir.' He wriggled his heavy body from behind the small table, resealed his tunic, and settled his cap with as much precision as if he were about to represent the Queen before the assembled nobility of Sargal. Dane hurried down the ladders, coming to a halt beside Ollie. It was the turn of the man at the foot of the ramp to bark an impatient demand. Well? Was that the theme word of every captain's vocabulary? You wait. Dane replied, with no inclination to give the Izzy officer any courtesy address. Close to a Terran year aboard the Solar Queen had inoculated him with pride in his own section of service. 
a free trader was answerable to his own officers and to no one else on earth, or among the stars, no matter how much discipline and official etiquette the companies used to enhance their power. He half expected the I.S. officers to leave after an answer such as that. For a company captain to be forced to wait upon the convenience of a free trader must be galling in the extreme. And the fact that this one was doing just that was an indication that the Queen's crew did, perhaps, have the edge of advantage in any coming bargain. In the meantime, the Izy contingent fumed below, while Ollie lounged whistling against the exit port, playing with his sleep rod, and Dane studied the grass forest. His boot nudged a packet just inside the port casing, and he glanced inquiringly from it to Ollie. Cat Ransom, the other answered his unspoken question. So that was it, the fee for Sinbad's return. What is it today? Sugar, about a tablespoonful, the engineer assistant returned, and two colored stilos. So far they haven't run up the price on us. I think they're sharing out the spoil evenly. A new cub brings him back every night. As did all Terran ships, the Solar Queen carried a cat as an important member of the regular crew. And the portly Sinbad, before their landing on Sargal, had never presented any problem. He had done his duty of ridding the ship of unusual and usual pests and cargo despoilers with dispatch, neatness, and energy, and when in port on alien worlds had never shown any inclination to go a-roving. But the sense of Sargal had apparently intoxicated him, shearing away his solid dignity and middle-aged dependability. Now Sinbad flashed out of the Queen at the opening of her port in the early morning, and was brought back, protesting with both voice and claws, at the end of the day by that member of the juvenile population whose turn it was to collect the standing reward for his forceful delivery. Within three days it had become an accepted business transaction which satisfied everyone but Sinbad. The scrape of metal boot soles on ladder rungs warned of the arrival of their officers. Ollie and Dane withdrew down the corridor, leaving the entrance open for Jellicoe and Van Ryck. Then they drifted back to witness the meeting with the Izies. There were no prolonged greetings between the two parties, no offer of hospitality, as might have been expected between Terrans on an alien planet a quarter of the galaxy away from the Earth which had given them a common heritage. Jellicoe, with Van Ryck at his shoulder, halted before he stepped from the ramp, so that the three intersolar men, captain, cargo master, and escort, whether they wished or no, were put in the disadvantageous position of having to look up to a captain whom they, as members of one of the powerful companies, affected to despise. The lean, well-muscled, trim figure of the Queen's commander gave the impression of hard-bitten force held in check by will control, just as his face, under its thick layer of space burn, was that of an adventurer accustomed to make split-second decisions, an estimate underlined by that seam of blaster burn across one flat cheek. Van Ryck, with a slight change of dress, could have been a company man in the higher ranks, or so the casual observer would have placed him, until an observer marked the eyes behind those sleepy drooping lids, or caught a certain note in the calm, unhurried drawl of his voice. To look at the two senior officers of the free trading spacer were the antithesis of each other. In action they were each half a powerful steamroller hole. As a good many men in the service, scattered over a half-dozen or so planets, had discovered to their cost in the past. Now Jellicoe brought the heels of his space boots together with an extravagant click, and his hand flourished at the fore of his helmet in a gesture which was better suited to the patrol hero of a slightly out-of-date video serial. Jellico, Solar Queen, Free Trader, he identified himself brusquely, and added, This is Van Ryck, 
our cargo master. Not all the flush had faded from the face of the I.S. captain. Grange of the dart, he did not even sketch a salute, intersolar, Cali, cargo master, and he did not name the hovering third member of his party. Jellicoe stood waiting, and after a long moment of silence, Grange was forced to state his business. We have until noon. Jellicoe, his fingers hooked on his belt, simply waited, and under his level gaze the icy captain began to find the going hard. They gave us until noon, he started once more, to get together. Jellicoe's voice came coldly remote. There is no reason for any getting together, Grange. By rights, I can have you up before the trade board for poaching. The Solar Queen has sole trading rights here. If you up ship within a reasonable amount of time, I'll be inclined to let it pass. After all, I have no desire to run all the way to the nearest patrol post to report you. You can't expect to buck in her solar. We'll make you an offer. That was Callie's contribution, made probably because his commanding officer couldn't find words explosive enough. Jellicoe, whose forte was more direct action, took an excursion into heavy-handed sarcasm. You, Isies, have certainly been given excellent briefing. I would advise a little closer study of the code, and not all the sections in small symbols at the end of the tape, either. We're not bucking anyone. You'll find our registration for Sargal down on tapes at the center, and I suggest that the sooner you withdraw, the better, before we cite you for illegal planeting. Grange had gained control of his emotions. "'We're pretty far from center here,' he remarked. It was a statement of fact, but it carried overtones which they were able to assess correctly. The Solar Queen was a free trader, alone on an alien world. But the I.S. ship might be cruising in company, ready to summon aid, men, and supplies. Dane drew a deep breath. The Izees must be sure of themselves. Not only that, but they must want what Sargal had to offer to the point of being willing to step outside the law to get it. The I.S. captain took a step forward. "'I think we understand each other now,' he said, his confidence restored. Van Ryke answered him, his deep voice cutting across the sighing of the wind in the grass forest. Your proposition? Perhaps this return to their implied threat bolstered their belief in the infallibility of the company, their conviction that no independent dared stand up against the might and power of the intersolar. Callie replied, We'll take up your contract, men a profit to you, and you up ship before the Salariki are confused over whom they're to deal with. And the amount of the profit? Van Ryke bored in. Oh, Callie shrugged, say ten per cent of Cam's last shipment. Jellico laughed. Generous, aren't you, Izzy? Ten per cent of a cargo which can't be assessed. The gang on Limbo kept no records of what they plundered. We don't know what he was carrying when he crashed on Limbo, countered Callie swiftly. We'll base our offer on what he carried to Axel. Now Van Ryk chuckled. I wonder who figured that one out, he inquired of the scented winds. He must save the company a fair amount of credits one way or another. Interesting offer. By the bland satisfaction to be read on the three faces below, the I.S. men were assured of their victory. The Solar Queen would be paid off with a pittance, under the vague threat of company retaliation she would upship from Sargal, and they would be left in possession of the rich Koros trade, to be commended and rewarded by their superiors. Had they, Dane speculated, ever had any dealings with free traders before, 
at least with the brand of independent adventurers such as Man the Solar Queen. Van Ryke burrowed in his belt pouch and then held out his hand. On the broad palm lay a flat disk of metal. Very interesting, he repeated. I shall treasure this recording. The sight of that disk wiped all satisfaction from the icy faces. Grange's purplish flush spread up from his tight tunic collar. Callie blinked, and the unknown third's hand dropped to his sleep rod. An action which was not overlooked by either Dane or Ollie. A smooth set-down to you, Jellicoe gave the conventional leave-taking of the service. You'd better, the icy captain began hotly, then seeing the disc Van Ryke held, that sensitive bit of metal and plastic which was recording this interview for future reference, he shut his mouth tight. Yes, the Queen's cargo master prompted politely. But Callie had taken his captain's arm and was urging Grange away from the spacer. "'You have until noon to lift,' was Jellicoe's parting shot as the three in company livery started toward the road. "'I don't think that they will,' he added to Van Ryk. The cargo master nodded. "'You wouldn't in their place,' he pointed out reasonably. "'On the other hand, they've had a bit of a blast they weren't expecting. It's been a long time since Grange heard anybody say no. A shock which is going to wear off. Jellicoe's habitual distrust of the future gathered force. This, Van Ryke tucked the disc back into his pouch, sent them off Vector a parsec or two. Grange is not one of the strong-arm blaster boys. Suppose Tang Ya does a little listening in, and maybe we can rig another surprise, if Grange does try to ask advice of someone off-world. In the meantime, I don't think they are going to meddle with the Celeriki. They don't want to have to answer awkward questions if we turn up a patrol ship to ask them. So, he stretched and beckoned to Dane, we shall go to work once more. Again, two paces behind Van Ryke, Dane tramped to the trade circle of the Salariki clansmen. They might have walked out only five or six minutes of ship time before, and the natives betrayed no particular interest in their return. But, Dane noted, there was only one empty stool, one ceremonial table in evidence. The Salariki had expected only one Terran trader to join them. What followed was a dreary round of ceremony, an exchange of platitudes and empty good wishes and greetings. No one mentioned coro stones, or even perfume bark, that he was willing to offer the off-world traders. None lifted so much as a corner of his trade cloth, under which, if he were ready to deal seriously, his hidden hand would meet that of the buyer so that by finger-pressure alone they could agree or disagree on price. But such boring sessions were part of trade, and Dane, keeping a fraction of attention on the speeches and drinkings together, watched those around him with an eye which tried to assess and classify what he saw. The keynote of the Salariki character was a wary independence. The only form of government they would tolerate was a family clan organization. Feuds and deadly duels between individuals and clans were the accepted way of life, and every male who reached adulthood went armed and ready for combat until he became a speaker of the past, too old to bear arms in the field. Due to the nature of their battling lives, relatively few of the Salariki ever reached that retirement. Short-lived alliances between family members sometimes occurred, usually when they were to face a common enemy greater than either. But a quarrel between chieftains, a fancied insult would rip that open in an instant. Only under the trade shield could seven clans sit this way without their warriors being at one another's furred throats. An hour before sunset, 
half turn his goblet upside down on his table, a move followed speedily by every chieftain in the circle. The conference was at an end for that day. And as far as Dane could see, it had accomplished exactly nothing, except to bring the Isies into the open. What had Traxt Cam discovered which had given him the trading contract with these suspicious aliens? Unless the men from the Queen learned it, they could go on talking until the contract ran out and get no farther than they had today. From his training, Dane knew that off times contact with an alien race did require long and patient handling. But between study and experiencing the situation himself there was a gulf, and he thought somewhat ruefully that he had much to learn before he could meet such a situation with Van Rijk's unfailing patience and aplomb. The cargo master seemed in no wise tired by his wasted day, and Dane knew that Van would probably sit up half the night, going over for the hundredth time Traxt Cam's sketchy recordings in another painstaking attempt to discover why and how the other free trader had succeeded where the Queen's men were up against a stone wall. The harvesting of Coro stones was, as Dane and all those who had been briefed from Cam's records knew, a perilous job. Though the rule of the Salariki was undisputed on the land masses of Sargal, it was another matter in the watery world of the shallow seas. There the Gorp were in command of the territory, and one had to be constantly alert for attack from the sly reptilian intelligence, so alien to the thinking processes of both Salariki and Terran, that there was, or seemed to be, no point of possible contact. One went gathering Koros gems after balancing life against gain. And perhaps the Salariki did not see any profit in that operation. Yet Traxt Cam had brought back his bag of gems. Somehow he had managed to secure them in trade. Van Wright climbed the ramp, hurrying on into the Queen as if he would not get back to his records soon enough. But Dane paused and looked back at the grass jungle a little wistfully. To his mind, these early morning hours were the best time on Sargal. The light was golden, the night winds had not yet arisen. He disliked exchanging the freedom of the open for the confinement of the spacer. And, as he hesitated there, two of the juvenile population of Sargal came out of the forest. Between them they carried one of their hunting nets, a net which now enclosed a quiet but baneful-eyed captive, Sinbad, being delivered for nightly ransom. Dane was reaching for the pay to give the captors, when, to his real astonishment, one of them advanced, and pointed with an extended forefinger claw to the open port. "'Go in!' he formed the trade lingo words with care. And Dane's surprise must have been plain to read, for the cub followed his speech with a vigorous nod and set one foot on the ramp to underline his desire. For one of the Salariki, who had continually manifested their belief that Terrans and their ship were an offense to the nostrils of all right living men, to wish to enter the spacer was an astonishing about face. But any advantage, no matter how small, which might bring about a closer understanding must be seized at once. Dane accepted the growling Sinbad and beckoned, knowing better than to touch the boy. Come. Only one of the junior clansmen obeyed that invitation. The other watched, big-eyed, and then scuttled back to the forest when his fellow called out some suggestion. He was not going to be trapped. Dane led the way up the ramp, paying no visible attention to the young Salaric, nor did he urge the other on when he lingered for a long moment or two at the port. In his mind, the cargo master apprentice was feverishly running over the list of general trade goods. What did they carry which would make a suitable and intriguing gift for a small alien with such a promising bump of curiosity. 
if he had only time to get to Van Ryck. The Salarik was inside the corridor now. His nostrils spread, assaying each and every odor in this strange place. Suddenly his head jerked, as if tugged by one of his own net ropes. His interest had been riveted by some scent his sensitive senses had detected. His eyes met Dane's in appeal. Swiftly the Terran nodded, and then followed with a lengthened stride as the Salarik sped down into the lower reaches of the Queen, obviously in quest of something of great importance. End of chapter 2